Welcome to Annette on Life, Liberty, and Happiness, a podcast where I talk about the Constitution, history, politics, and anything else that I feel like talking about. This podcast can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, um, YouTube, all the usual places. I really encourage you to go to YouTube if you haven't gone there yet. Like and subscribe, share, all those other good things. And today we will be talking about the liberty aspect of my podcast. And the reason I wanted to have this discussion is because, as you know, we have these stay-at-home orders going on all over the country with a few states that have not gotten on board, lucky states. Um, and if you have followed me at all, you know that I did an episode on whether or not the stay-at-home orders are constitutional. And um, my friend and fellow attorney, DK Williams, and I both agreed that they are indeed not constitutional. So some of the things that we were concerned about when these first went, were put into place was that the uh, people would start being um, bothered, um, harassed, and arrested for doing things that do not seem illegal or wrong or anything. <laughs> and so, of course, it was only a matter of time before that happened. And um, one of these incidents happened here in my home state of Colorado up in Brighton, and I've been sharing these stories on my Facebook page, and you've probably seen them um, there and lots of other places, but we have a gentleman who was arrested for playing t-ball in the park right in front of his six-year-old daughter, and that is Matt Mooney, who is joining me today. Hello, Matt. Hey, Annette. How's it going? Good. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. It was funny. I read your story, and I got all upset, and I shared it on my Facebook page, and then I, I saw again a few days later, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to ask him if he wants to come on, and um, here you are. And so it, I, I read your story, I've watched the little video, the home video that was recorded of the incident, and um, uh, needless to say, I was pretty outraged, and most everyone else that's read the story is pretty outraged because it was obvious overreach. You have a bad stay-at-home order law and then you have some uh, police officers who overreacted, and that's a really bad combination. So for those of you that don't know the story, I'm just going to let Matt talk us through it and um, give us a little background, Matt. You are former law enforcement yourself, aren't you? I am. So um, not only my prior law enforcement, but I am a disabled combat veteran. Um, oh, I, I served in the Army for seven years, got out, I joined Colorado State Patrol, and I was on the State Patrol for about three years. Um, that was about the time the whole Trayvon Martin thing was happening, and th there was a lot of reasons for me getting out. Um, so now I own a construction company, so I'm an entrepreneur as well. <clears throat> um, so a couple Sundays ago, we it was a beautiful day. I think it was like 60-some degrees out, 69 degrees out, something like that. And, uh, you know, prior to this, we had been practicing the whole stay-at-home order. Um, to the extent that we could. Now, my wife is an essential employee. She works at a hospital. Um, I own a construction company, so we're kind of exempt and I'm still trying to push through, but it is taking a toll on my business. And then we got my daughter who is high energy, six-year-old little girl. And, you know, that's been the biggest challenge with this stay at home thing is yeah, how do you release that don't energy? understand what's going on, first of all. And even if they do, that doesn't change their nature. They still need to get outside and run around and be crazy and do six-year-old stuff. Right. And, and so, <laughs> you know, about halfway through the day, me and my wife had enough. We're like, we're just going to go out to our park. And uh, I'm going to share my screen just to kind of show everybody where this park is. And this is in Brighton, right? This is in Brighton. And this is like your neighborhood park that you would ordinarily go to? Right. So this is Thomas Donaldson Park. All right. And this blue dot is about where I live. Um, so you can see the park is fairly close to my house. It's not like we traveled 20 miles to a park. Yeah, it looks like it's within walking distance. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, we can zoom in here and uh, kind of here in the middle, you have the playground area. You have a little restroom facility. You have a gazebo. They have some horseshoe pits. They do a bunch of soccer stuff. Where this incident took place, or actually, let me back up. So they had a bunch of signs posted, but they were posted right along the playground. They were posted around the gazebo and they were posted by the restroom. 
So we were just south of the playground, kind of right here on the edge of the actual park and what is considered an open space. All right, so first, before you continue, one of the stories I read said that the officers were responding because there were like 12 to 15 people playing there. Uh, so was there a big group playing football or something? What was going on? So there was multiple groups that day. So kind of over here by the soccer field, there was- This is a big park. For those of you that can't see it, this is, the, the playground is, is a small area, but the rest of it is a rather large area. Obviously it's got a couple of soccer fields and I don't know what else, but it's big. All right, sorry, go on. Absolutely, so kind of over by one of these soccer fields, there was a group of about eight people and they were playing kind of, kind of in a sense playing baseball, but it was, it looked like two families, bunch of little kids, they were hitting the ball, throwing it, whatever. Um, there was a couple other small groups that were dispersed throughout the entire area, um, both in down here in the open area as well as off to the um, west side or east side here. So and there we were three or four small to medium groups kind of spaced out around the park. Right. Okay. So prior to going to the park, and I'll go ahead and uh, take the screen sharing off here. Um, <clears throat> Bright, the city of Brighton had issued a press release, and I'm just going to read it for you so there's no misinterpretation. Um, it says, effective 328 2020 the Happy Trails Dog Park is also closed. To ensure the safety of our community and staff, all playgrounds, tennis courts, basketball courts, and picnic areas in the city of Brighton will be closed as of today, March 26th. These closures fall in line with the state public health order issued on Wednesday that orders all park amenities, including but not limited to playgrounds, skate parks, basketball courts, tennis courts, picnic areas, public restrooms, and similar spaces conductive to public gatherings are currently closed due to the risk and spread of COVID-19. Residents may still enjoy walking paths, trails, and open spaces in the city as long as they practice social distancing of at least six feet from other people. And then it goes on, thank you for your cooperation and understanding. Um, then we get to the signs that are posted at the park. Okay, so this was a press release, you said? Yep. This on this the was, website. And so it says they're basically saying they're closing the areas that are conducive to gatherings. So basically they're trying to avoid groups getting together and playing sports and kids playing together on the playground, that kind of thing. That's what it sounds like to me. Right. Okay. Um, so then we get to the signs that are posted at the park and it talks about the park closure, but at the bottom it says to engage in outdoor activity individually in, or in groups of no more than four persons, parks remain open for walking, hiking, biking, running, and similar activities provided individuals comply with social distancing requirements. <clears throat> so that sign refers more directly to the park. Um, the press release, you know, mentions open spaces are still open and accessible for the public, right. so long as you practice social distancing. Um, now, social distancing doesn't necessarily apply to a household unit. No, it does not. But um, I'm glad you brought that up. That was going to be the next place I was going to go. And that's, you know, I keep hearing things. <laughs> this is so ridiculous. I have to just cover this right now because it annoys the heck out of me. Uh, on on like next door apps and things like that, I keep seeing these posts. Oh, it just you know I saw three people talking together at the park, not social distance from each other, and it's like, is that what we've really come to? And someone else, and actually they they were on there today, and it was nice to see some people on the other side. It, they were being sarcastic because they said. To, did someone see the, the sheriff? There, there were like three sheriff cars in the neighborhood today. What was going on? And someone else says, oh, did someone go to the mailbox without a mask? <laughs> like sarcastically, you know, it was funny. Right. So the rest of us all piled onto that. And um, I just thought that was funny because, yeah, I, I, there was another post one day where it said, well, I just saw that the golf course is open. Is, is that an essential business? I do not understand why the golf course is open. And it, and it just, it's such an insane time where Americans, so many Americans are like, please tell me to, what to do. And please, you know, let me rat on my neighbors for not doing exactly what I was told to do, especially like <laughs> golfing on a golf course. You know? You're right. 
it's just because it's gotten insane. So um, just the idea, even that we're talking about the police coming to um, even educate people about hanging out at a park is ridiculous. But that's where we are. So anyway, go on. Yeah, and, and to kind of add to that, that's what actually started this whole incident was somebody called the police, <laughs> reported people for being in the park. Uh-huh. Yeah, so... And you have so papers. I always think of the of World War II Germany when this kind of thing goes on. They're going to come around. Do you have your papers? Why are you here? Why are you congregated? You know? <laughs> yeah. It's, people, I, I just don't get it. You know, if you don't, if it doesn't affect you personally, why does it even matter? Well, I, I think there's two groups and maybe they overlap a little bit, but there's one group that is so paranoid and so fearful about this virus that any, and, and I know people like that, they're very anxious people. And then this virus comes along and it does, it's, it's dangerous. It can be deadly to some people. And so they, they take that and they freak out and they see anyone not wearing a mask or not social distancing and that causes them great anxiety and fear and they want to do something about it. That group I kind of understand, they're annoying, but they're, it's understandable. Then there's another group that just likes to tell people what to do and likes to rat on each other. And I see so much of that and there, there's probably a little overlap, but that second group of people that just loves to tell people what to do and wants to control other people's lives are the ones that are calling the cops about these kinds of things. So that those people do not belong in this country. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they, no, don't, they don't they don't understand what America is about, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna go too much into my personal thoughts on that, but uh, yeah. That's good. I'll supply all mine. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so kind of getting back to it. So someone Sunday, called the cops and you were there and Sunday, April 5th, and it's about 4.30 in the afternoon, beautiful day out. So we're at the park, open space, whatever you want to classify it as. And based off everything that's been published, we're doing the right thing. So it's just you know, the three of you hanging out in an area separate from the other groups that are hanging out together. Exactly. Okay. Um, so I'm playing t-ball with my daughter, you know, we're, we're throwing the ball back and forth, playing catch, whatever you want to call it, you know, we're, we're just spending time in the park, releasing some of her energy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so next thing I know, I hear this gentleman speaking to my wife saying the park's closed, everybody has to leave. And I never saw him come up, I just overhear this, so I look up and there's three officers standing there. Ah. And I look on the street, there's two cop cars parked there, so. So you don't know if they were over at the other groups first? To, to try and disperse them or why they um, were there? So it, it quickly became clear we were the first group they contacted. Ah. Um, I mean, in the immediate moment, I didn't know that, but through the way the interaction went, um, it became clear. And then reading the police reports and everything afterwards and talking to other people, we, we were the first group they contacted. Um, so this officer starts going, you know, the park's closed, you have to leave. I was like, it, the park isn't closed. You know, it's the playground equipment, the, all that stuff is closed, but this is open space. You know, we're in a group of less than four. It's not closed to us. And he wants to continue to argue. I was like, look, if you have to write me a ticket, write me a ticket, but I'm not leaving. Wait, I've done nothing did, wrong. At what, did you at any point say to him, there's a sign right over there that says four or less people can congregate or can play here? Um, I bring up the sign a little bit later, and we'll get back to that. All right, um, all right. That was the, my first thought. I was, <clears throat> do you want to go check the sign? Because <laughs> that's the sign that says what to do here. But anyway. Right. Um, yeah, so my, my immediate, you know, thought was I'm not trying to argue with these officers. They have a job to do. I respect what they do. I used to be a state trooper, but I don't agree with them. So, okay, I'll take it to court. I'll fight it in court. This isn't the time or place because a pissing match never ends well. Yeah, especially uh, law enforcement. Mm. Yeah, so I'm like, write me a ticket. And they kind of get this dumbfounded look on their face, like, okay, what do we do now? Yeah, and, because they uh, were thinking they were just going to come and tell you, and then you would walk away, and it would be all over. Yeah. Right. So two of the officers kind of back up. One of them immediately gets on his phone to, in the moment, I'm assuming, his supervisor. And the third cop goes around to every other group in the park and starts kicking them out. 
Um, so that's kind of why, you know, I believe we were the first group contacted in that moment. So was um, that, did everyone else leave? So pretty much everybody else left. There was one group um, kind of, they were way out in the middle of this open space. And uh, the officer was kind of over there for quite a while. And I, I hear some of it, but I can't really hear that far away. There's a lot going on. Um, and, and, you know, he's kind of, they're, they're giving him a little bit of pushback. Um, and that actually ends up being Kirby Whalen, who is a former city council member and the one that took the video of this whole incident, which prior to this, I had no idea who he was. I knew the name because he was city council, but I didn't know who he was. I would never have been able to pick him out of, you know, a lineup. So talking to him afterwards, he's basically telling the cops, look, I appreciate what you guys do. I respect you, but you need to get somebody a little bit higher up over here to tell me because what you're doing is wrong. Um, and then again, talking to him afterwards, he kind of, he's like, you know, I saw you standing up. And so he, I was, he told me he was just kind of backing off. And so he had told the officers that they needed to find someone higher up. So he was not going to comply automatically with whatever they wanted him to do either. Correct. And he told you later. So that's where you got that from. Okay. Yep. So once he kind of starts to comply, um, his, his neighbor, which was another group, they were kind of close, but they were more than the six feet apart. They were also in the same area. Um, she kind of comes walking up and she asks one of the officers a question and she's like, you know, kind of referring to me and my family, she's asking me, you know, so this is against the law? <laughs> and uh, I, I just looked back and I was like, yeah, it's a violation of your constitutional rights. It's okay. Um, never said anything else to her in this instance. Never asked her to record this. Nothing like that. Um, so this third officer is finally done. He comes back up. The three of them kind of have a little powwow for a moment. And then they're like, we need your information. We need your ID. Who are you? And I'm like, I've done nothing wrong. I have no obligation to give it to you. I'm not going to. All right. So this is something that always, uh, I've had many people ask me this question since this incident came up. And as a former state trooper, you probably know this, but you're not required to give your ID. Or let me put it this way. An officer is not supposed to ask for ID unless he has a reasonable belief that you've either done something wrong, are doing something wrong, or are about to do something wrong. Isn't that right? Isn't that the standard? That's the gist of it. So an officer can ask, but they can't demand. So if, you know, as an officer, if I came up to you and said, hey, can I have your ID? If you give it to me, cool. If not, I have no right to. At that point, since I'm not about to, or he has no, he can't articulate reasonable suspicion that I'm about to commit a crime, I am committing a crime, or I have committed a crime. Um, it's what we considered a consensual contact. So it's one person talking to another. You can walk away at any point. Right. There, um, there, was, no, there was no arrest here. There were no rights read. There was nothing like that. At this point, you're just talking. Um, he can question you but he can't demand ID. And again, it's like, it's that, where are your papers? You know, that's the Germany thing. Like you, you're not you're required to just show your papers for no reason or show, show your ID for no reason. And obviously you're in a park, the sign backed you up. I saw the picture of the sign. You, you're clearly not violating any laws. You're not violating any social distancing guidelines. And frankly, even if you were, at some point, we're going to see some of these um, convictions uh, questioned, hopefully go up to the Supreme Court, because the, the stay-at-home orders are so obviously unconstitutional that uh, because you violated them, it's, it's not illegal. I mean, you're, a lot of people are going to have problems going to be cited. I know a lot of people are cited, um, and that's going to keep happening. But at some point, these have got to be challenged in some way. So, but anyway, right. you, so you did not give him your ID. He asked for your ID and you, you declined. Exactly. And uh, so they, they asked for it again. They're like, you know, well, you told us to write you a ticket. And we need your ID. I was like, well, I haven't done anything wrong. So I'm not obligated to give it to you. And an argument kind of ensues and it becomes that pissing match that I was trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. of, you know, they're demanding my ID and, you know, I'm arguing back. I, this is an open space. I'm allowed to be here. Do you, I even asked the officer, I was like, do you know what the sign behind me states? Because they kept saying, well, there's signs everywhere. I was like, do you know what that sign says? Well, it says the parks are closed. That's all they could tell me. I'm like, well, if that's what you believe, then fine. 
Um, so I'm like, I'm not giving you my information. I'm not IDing myself. Um, they even have some young officer that comes up and he's like, Hey, I didn't catch your name. I was like, cause I didn't give it to you. <laughs> um, so at this point they're, they're like, you know, look, if you don't give us your ID, we're going to put you in handcuffs. We're going to take you down process you and book you. And they're like, you want us to do that in front of your daughter? I was like, if that's what you have to do, then, then go for it. Okay. So what are your daughter and wife doing at this point? Um, so during the initial contact, you know, my, my daughter got a little scared. She's like, daddy, I don't want you to go to jail. And I'm like, look, I've done nothing wrong. You know, we're, we're doing the right thing. I'm not going to go to jail. There's, there's no way. <laughs> um, my wife, she is not a very confrontational person. So she's like, let's just go. I was like, no, it's the principle of this. And she starts picking stuff up and I'm like, no, we're not leaving. I was like, you can leave if you want, but I'm, I'm making this stand. Um, so, so when she, did the filming start? So the filming started um, a little bit later on in the story when they actually do start putting me in handcuffs. Um, Kirby Whalen and his neighbor and all them were still walking out of the park. They kind of stopped to watch what was going on with me and the officers and then they start filming as soon as they start putting me in cuffs. Okay. Um, so the one thing I could see from the filming, I mean, it was pretty grainy, so I couldn't really tell a whole lot, but it was very obvious that there were not groups of people <laughs> congregating, you know, in, in anywhere near you. So it was obvious that you were not there with a group of people. Right. Yeah. I mean, to kind of put it in perspective and give the honest, you know, transparent, there were other groups around, like we discussed earlier. Um, and were, you point, were not in that group. In, in, I was not in that group. not come down to the park with a group of 10 people, or you did not join any of the other groups and start playing ball and contact sports or anything like that. Exactly. Um, and at the time of the video being taken, all the other groups had left. So you don't even see them in the video, but. They were there earlier, but, but my point is still the same, that you were not a part of those groups. Exactly. You were a part, you were a part of a group of three related people who <laughs> all lived together. And instead of social, staying um, non-social distance away from each other at home, you were non-social distance away from each other out in the open air at a park. And that's supposedly the problem here, because weren't they telling you that you were violating social distance rules, or were they telling you that you were in violation of uh, uh, a closed park rule? So it, it came down as I was in violation of the public health order closing parks. Ah. Uh. Yeah. yeah, that's such a lame, like, it's like, it, it almost feels to me as if these police officers decided, well, this guy's giving us attitude, so we're going to do something about this. We're going to find something to arrest him for, instead of just, instead of just doing what we're supposedly, what, we, what I've heard they were going to be doing is basically educating people, right? Um, okay, well, you should know this. Uh, but the problem is, if they would have educated you, it would have, they would have realized that you're following all of the <laughs> guidelines. Exactly. So there was nothing to educate you on. Uh, it's just that they decided that you were in violation of this closed park rule, supposedly. Right. So yeah. um, I read somewhere that the police report said that you had like pushed one of the officers or fought back physically. So <laughs> kind of walk me through the the handcuff. I think I read this on your Facebook page and then you responded to what happened. Right. So after, you know, the, the pissy match and I told him like, you know, if you got to do what you got to do, then arrest me. And uh, I kind of stuck out my hands like, you know, I'm in front of you. Do it. Do it. Like I, I'm not resisting. You know, if that's what you got to do, that's what you got to do. And uh, so they're like, okay, turn around, place your hands on top of your head. So I do that. You know, now I got my daughter and my wife behind me got three officers behind me and uh, none of them are wearing masks. In fact, they actually have masks hanging off of their pistol belt on their side, but they don't Just have them on. emergencies, I guess. You've got to protect the ammunition, I guess. I don't know. Um, okay, wait, Tim, as a state trooper, did you ever arrest anyone? Or was it just oh yeah. like, okay. Oh yeah. So you've been on the other side of this before. Right. All right, so they, they, you put your hands on your head and then what? Right. So or did they do it? You did it or they did it? I did it. They gave commands and I followed their command. So the command was turn around, place your hands on your head. All right. That's the only command that they gave me. Um, so not wearing masks. They're not wearing gloves. I comply with what they say. They come up and uh, one officer grabs my right wrist. And of course, they didn't give me any other cans. So I have my fingers interlaced behind my head. 
uh -huh. I know what's about to happen, but uh, you know, it's a pissing match at this point. So a little bit on my side, but so they grab my right wrist and they try to separate my hands and because they're interlaced, they don't come apart so easily. <laughs> so, you know, they're back here. They, they rip this hand free mm -hmm. and then they put me in handcuffs you know, and walk me up to the patrol car. Um, <clears throat> it's funny, you, know. you know, as a former, um, patrolman, why do they want your hands on your heads? on your head first if they're then going to put them behind your back to be cuffed. I'm just curious, like, why that's the... Probably to, you know, ensure no weapons, anything like that. My, my hand, they can see my hands, they're controlled. Because then, yeah, you always see that in the movie, the hands up on the heads, and then they grab the hands and put them behind your back. So they had to forcibly separate your hands and then put them behind your back. So they did that, and then they cuffed you. Yeah, so that was the extent of it. That's what happened. Um, then we start What's reading the... What are doing at this point? Um, you know, everything happened so quickly. I, I heard her kind of go to whine something or another, and my wife kind of stepped in and was like, you know, everything will be fine. You know, I'm glad that your, your wife was there. I'm, yeah. I'm just guessing that this would have gone down a little bit differently if it had been just you and your daughter, because you would, would have probably thought, I can't, you know, leave my daughter. Well, yeah, I, I probably would have complied and kind of rolled over on my rights a little bit, which mm -hmm. sucks, but. But yes, when you've got a kid, you don't want the kid to. <laughs> I mean, if you're arrested and your daughter's there, they're going to what call social services or you have to call your wife. Or what, and it becomes a lot more complicated at this point. Right. So, um, all right. So they cuff you. They cuff me. They walk me up to the, you know, their patrol vehicle. They, uh, they pat me down, take everything out of my pockets. What are you thinking my, at this point? Uh, I... I I'm kind of on the verge of laughing, but then, you know, I have the, the hundred things going through my head, like, well, crap, Monday, I run a business, I have this and that to do, like, I'm really going to be spending the night in jail, this is a first for me, like. So, because you no don't one. have any record, is what you're saying. Yeah, no record. Okay. Um, First time you've been cuffed? In, in a real life scenario, yes. I mean, obviously, in training with State Patrol, I've been cuffed many times. I was afraid that, that you were going to say by someone other than my wife. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to take it there, but <laughs> all right. So this is the first. <laughs> this is the first time you've been cuffed by law enforcement, but not in a training scenario or anything else that we won't mention. Um, and so, and it's the first time you've been put in the back of a, a cop car. Uh, outside of any training as well. Right. All right. So did they read you your rights at this point or they just cuffed you and put you in the back? The, no rights were read. They just cuffed me and put me in the back. And, and that's kind of another misconception is unless they're about to ask you questions regarding, you know, what you've done wrong, they don't have to read your rights. Um, that's not- but You are under arrest. And right. You're obviously not free to go at this point. So- and, and that's, I've had so many people come out and say, oh, well, you were detained. You weren't arrested. Uh, oh, I, I was, and they fire back, you know, well, you were a state trooper. You should know this. You know, obviously you didn't know your job. Well, no, I know my job. You know, I was not free to leave. That is the classic definition of arrest. Yeah. I was in cuffs, not free to leave. Yes, I would confirm. Um, you know, regardless of what their policy says, you take it to court. That's, the judge is going to take, you know, the layman's, terminology of it and you know the did you feel like you were free to leave no <laughs> obviously not you're in obviously i wasn't you're you're being walked perp walked <laughs> to the back of the police car uh they take your stuff out of your pockets and they put you in the back and then and then what happens so i'm sitting in the back of this cop car there's no air on the windows are up and it's uh, i think it was 69 degrees that day so you know, it's not hot outside, but the cop car gets hot really fast. So at, by the end of this, I'm dripping in sweat. I'm miserable. Like I sit there for about 10 to 15 minutes. One of the officers is on his phone. The other two are laughing and joking, having a good old time. And I tried to get their attention at one point, but you have the plexiglass cage. Then you have the window. They, what do you they, mean you try to get their attention? Um, you know, I, I just yelled like, hey, can you somebody come roll the window down? So I, I yelled, hey um none of them even kind of flinched so they, they didn't hear me which so okay. you weren't you weren't cursing them out or pounding on the window or doing anything like that 
No, I, I couldn't pound on the window with my hand, and I wasn't about to do it with my head. So <laughs> didn't head butt the window. Or, uh, did it? Did it smell like vomit in the back seat or anything else gross back there? No, it just smelled like a car. Most uh, of us haven't been in the back of a cop car <laughs> or cuffed um, for those reasons. So, <laughs> you know, I played a cop for Halloween last year. That was my costume, and so I went around cuffing everyone for fun. But you know, it was those cuffs that come right off. So. Right. I, uh, but the idea of sitting in the back of a cop car with my hands in cuffs, feeling totally helpless like that, with two cops standing there laughing, and as I have three daughters, and, and, you know, we go down to the park, and it's closed now, but we ride bikes past the playground and everything, and sometimes we'll stop there and chat for a few minutes, and I, and I, when I read your story, I thought, I would be mortified if I was cuffed in front of my three girls, but I would be, I would feel even worse for them watching their mom get cuffed. However, I would have a really good time explaining to them later exactly why I stood up for my rights because yep. part of homeschool right now is they're learning the constitution. So, um, good for yeah, you. this is a good educational, uh, opportunity. I mean, six is a little young, but, she still can understand the concept of freedom and, the, you know, the freedom to go to the park, to move about freely and to leave your house. <laughs> All right. So you're sitting back there sweating and your wife and daughter are doing what at this point? Um, so by the time they get me to the cop car, they pat me down, take everything out of my pockets and get me in the back of this patrol car. I, my wife and daughter are gone. They, they picked up their stuff and left. They went home? Uh, they, they went well, let me back up. So in the mid middle of between the two contacts with the officers, I got on my phone to a friend of mine who is a Brighton City Council member, and he's also my neighbor. And I, I reached out to him I'm like, hey, to what extent are parks closed? I know what the signs say. I know what the public order said. But what, what is your take on it? And he's like, well, you know, the equipment's closed, but the open space is perfectly fine. I was like, okay, cool. Can you come down to the park? I'm getting harassed. And that was the last thing I got off to him. Oh, and can, can I just say that the fact that you even have to call someone to try and figure out the extent of the park closures because the, there is discrepancy between the uh, public notice on the website and the sign and all the rumors and everything tells you that obviously how can you comply with a law that's not clear and that the officers didn't even know and that you have to reach out to a city councilman in his view was even broader than what you read on that sign. So anyway, right. so you reached out to him and he said that the open spaces are open? Yep, he okay. said basically the park minus the, the city owned equipment and facilities is open. You can be there. You're just uh, not supposed to congregate, which is part of the stay at home order as opposed to the park order. So we're supposed to remember the stay at home order is no, no groups, like no congregating, right? And, uh, and it used to be groups of 10 or less because I was having like eight or nine people over until that ended, right? It used to be 10 or less. And yeah. then, uh, but at your park, it's four or less, whereas our park is closed, but you can ride your bike through it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you said, you know, you mentioned earlier, you know, these laws are confusing. They're not laws. They're public health orders. Yeah. They're not laws. Right. It's a good point. Um, and because who, the, first of all, they were not passed by a legislature. And so um, who's going to enforce these? Then the police officers are trying to enforce public health orders. Yeah, it's trying times for sure. Um, so sitting there in the back of the cop car, about 10 to 15 minutes go by. They finally, the one officer gets off his phone and they- Oh wait, why did your wife and daughter leave? Where did they-, oh, they Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so. I contacted that city council member and as they're putting me in handcuffs, I tell her, I was like, hey, I don't know if Tim got this message. Can you go to his house? Like, leave here, go to his house, tell him what happened. Because I don't know, at this point, I don't know who these other people in the park are that are filming. I can hear him narrating a film. <laughs> I don't know who they are. I don't know that my neighbor, Tim Watts, council member Watts, got my message. All I know is I'm going in the back of this cop car and I'm probably going to jail. Um, so I tell her, I was like, hey, go to his house, tell him what's going on, let's figure this out. So they pack up and they leave. I'm sitting in the back of the patrol car. I never see him leave because it took a little bit to get me to that point. You know, 
it was a little bit of a walk then patting me down and getting me back there they're gone um so about 10 to 15 minutes go by and uh well as they're walking me to the patrol car i see my neighbor tim watts pull up council member watts he pulls up he parks in front of the patrol vehicles and uh, he just sits there in his car which good for him i'm glad he didn't get involved because that's not really his place but i wanted him to see what was going on because it's city council that's directing the acting city manager who then controls the police department mm -hmm. so i got my information from the top and people argue well why did you go to city council you know they have no control they do they're the ones that are you know passing these orders and directing these public officials on what to do there are elected members um <clears throat> so he pulls up my wife and daughter are gone i'm sitting in the back of the patrol car finally the one officer gets off his phone they talk for a minute they open the door and they're like hey we're gonna have you step out i don't know what's going on i'm like okay so they they get me out of the car and uh they turn me around they're like okay we're gonna take the cuffs off when we do we're gonna do your left hand first I want you to place it on top of your head and then we're gonna take the other cuff off i was like well just so you know what i'm about to do i'm gonna wipe my face because i'm dripping in sweat and my nose itches like crazy like it's miserable and, and they didn't have a problem with that but it just goes to show like i wasn't trying to be combative i wasn't tr not trying to follow their orders you know and i wasn't trying to put them in any harm you were just trying to stand up for your rights exactly so they get me out of cuffs and they turn me around they're like okay so they give me this spiel about you know these are trying times information's constantly changing um, there was some confusion on open space versus park they're like, we agree this is an open space. We agree you did nothing wrong. You're free to go. And, and that's the extent of the conversation until I kind of start firing back. I'm like, okay, I get these are trying times. I get things are changing. But at what point do our constitutional rights become something that's new? It's not new information to me. And you violated a bunch of them. Um, and, and they didn't really have much to say. They kind of scoffed it off. And I was like, okay, well, how about this? Or I'm sorry, they, they told me they're just doing what they're told right there with the whole Nuremberg trials in Germany, you know, oh, we're just doing what we're told. Right. Um, so I fired back. I was like, okay, so let's say Governor Polis comes out tomorrow or, you know, the city manager comes out and says, firearms aren't allowed. Are you going to come to my house and take my firearms too? That's a clear violation. They, they completely ignored that. And they're like, well, you're free to go. Um, I had to I ask for my, over. <laughs> yeah. So I had to ask for my stuff back because they didn't initially hand it to me. I'm like, can I have my stuff? And they're like, oh yeah. We're sorry. Uh, so they give me my stuff and I go up and I talk to my neighbor, council member Watts. And he's like, he's like, what's going on? I'm like, well, <laughs> they uh, arrested me for playing at the park with Zoe, my daughter. Um, and he just starts shaking his head and he's like, well, he's like, we'll talk about it. Um, he's like, your, your wife and daughter are at my house. He's like, just go there. Um, he didn't want to offer me a ride in front of the officers, just trying to avoid that perception um no special of, favors or whatever well special favors and then not social distancing like oh space. right you know what it's, it's so ridiculous like i forget about the social distance thing because it's so insane to me you know like i went and helped some a friend move today up in johnstown and he's been a friend for a very long time and i haven't seen him since the pandemic started and i get up there and people are moving and they've got masks on and things and i'm and he needed a ride to home depot and i thought you know, technically, um, I'm not supposed to get in the car with this guy and get, you know, closer than social distance. That's how insane it is. But of course, I gave him a ride to Home Depot and did not social distance myself from my friend who I'm not quarantined with um, at the store. And when I left him, I gave him a hug because this is insane. This is stupid. I mean, the whole idea that we're all going to maintain six feet distance from anyone that we don't live with is ridiculous. And when I go to the store or I go for my walks or whatever, um, I don't wear masks because first of all, at the end of March, the CDC put out a video saying that masks were worthless, but all of a sudden now they're not. But I maintain social distance at Target and when I'm out, just so other people feel comfortable and don't freak out. Okay, that's fine. You know, I think it's ridiculous, but I will honor that so other people are comfortable. But this, the, it, most of this is insane so you're right i didn't even think about the fact get into a car with someone you're not social distance oh no you know just. all right yeah it's insane i'm right there with you like i go out to these stores and 
I'm not worried about it. No, but not, not for either. other people's peace of mind, you know, I will maintain that six foot distance. I don't wear a mask. Yeah. And, you know, the CDC put out that if you don't use the masks right, you are posing more of a risk. Yeah, I've seen that too. And there, that's one of the big problems with this whole pandemic, the whole situation. There is so many, there are so many unknowns. There are so much wide and varied information. No one really knows anything. There are lots and lots of guesses going on. And I think the, the social distancing, yes, I can see there's a reason behind, you know, staying six feet away from people so you don't get um, spittle from talking to them. Or, or I hear it's really the touching. I mean, that's something else I've heard. It's really when you touch someone else who's got it and then you touch your face, then you get it. Well, social distancing doesn't, I mean, I guess it keeps you from touching because you're too far away, but <laughs> it has nothing to do with touching. And then, um, you know, you hear that 1% of the people that, that catch it will die. And then you hear that it's only people that are older or immune suppressed. I mean, there's so much out there that we don't know. And that's the problem with the stay at home orders. They're so hugely broad and they're based on complete and total wide and varied information that you don't even know how, you know, if any of this is even necessary. And obviously we don't know because we, we've never faced this before, but to try and, and, you know, like cover all their bases, they do this huge broad order and this is what happens. I mean, not only are all the businesses shutting down and everyone's losing their jobs and losing their businesses, but then we've lost our constitutional rights to just you know, travel to the park. You know, walk outside of our houses and, and go and talk to neighbors closer than six feet apart. I hear people calling cops on uh, children playing in their front yard with each other. Brothers and sisters playing in their front yard with each other. Because, they, because it's a stay-at-home order, people have the idea that if you leave the house, you're committing a crime. That's, that's what some people actually think. Uh, that, I mean, it must be. Why else are you calling the cops on um, people? That's what was happening down in the Springs. People were... <laughs> Calling 911 because their neighbors were leaving their houses. It's ridiculous. All right, sorry. So that's another one of my little rants. Um, so your friend, the councilman, did not give you a ride. <laughs> so that you didn't yeah, so he didn't give me a ride, um, which I don't blame him. Um, you know, it's not a very far walk. I don't mind the exercise anyway. So I walked to his place and uh, we, we start having the conversation about what happened and, you know, I'm telling him my story from, from the beginning of what happened and the, the parts that he didn't see. Well, in the midst of this, he is on Facebook or whatever chat platform he had. I, I don't know the logistics of it, but with other city council members, the, the acting city manager, the mayor, and, you know, he, he isn't privy to the ability to respond because they can't have more than three members talking, otherwise it becomes city business and stuff like that. So he can observe what other people are saying, but he can't respond. Hmm. So he's kind of telling me some of the stuff that's coming across um, and, and we're kind of putting the pieces together of, um, my wife talked to the guy that was filming and his neighbor and she got the name Kirby. So then we're, okay, well, not many people have the name Kirby. So that's probably Kirby Whalen. He lives in our neighborhood. Um, and he is actually the council member that my neighbor, Tim Watts, replaced. Um, ah. didn't get him kicked out, but Kirby was done, and he just kind of took over. So they have that, you know, relationship. Um, well, Kirby immediately got on the phone to another city council member, mem uh, council member Johnson, also the mayor pro tem, um, and immediately was demanding answers while I'm still getting arrested. Like, the you know, wow. he's like, what are you guys doing? Um, so it immediately went up the chain. And I feel that's kind of the only reason I didn't go to jail. Uh -huh. um, so it became very apparent, you know, all the pieces started fitting together of who got involved, how quickly they got involved. And um, other members that are social activists, um, they were crucial in getting our mayor uh, recalled last year. We're getting involved and people were starting to demand answers and they sent a, a letter to the city or a Facebook message to the city saying, hey, I'm giving you 30 minutes to make this right or I'm going public with it. So this was like all real time, like you're sitting in the back of a cop car and these people, the city councilman and former city councilman 
are, and the social activists are all starting to like uh, take action to try and fix this. Right. That's Everything amazing. happened. Yeah, you know, I was going to say that that just tells me that if you had not been connected in that way, and if you had been some other Joe Blow on the street, uh, yeah, you would probably would have gone to jail. Yeah. And, and I didn't tell them at the time, you know, I'm a disabled combat vet. I didn't tell them I'm prior state patrol. They didn't need to know. Well, let's see what they do by themselves. And we found that out. Um, so did you find out what they um, found out while you were waiting for 10 or 15 minutes? Like, what they what information they were getting on the uh, the phone or the yep so i have that all in a police report right here and uh we'll get into that in a minute all right um so while i'm standing there talking to council member watts my friend and neighbor um he's telling me the stuff that's coming through this city about how i was combative and uh <laughs> i'm just like really he's like did you have any weapons on you i was like no not at all i mean i had a baseball bat but we were playing t-ball um, and I don't even think I was holding it. According to the report, I was, but everything happened so quick, I may or may not have been. I don't recall. Um, but didn't have any other weapons. He's like, well, what did you do? I was like, I did what they told me. I didn't resist. You know, I, um, I complied. You know, they, they said they were going to take me to jail. I offered up my hands. I was like, okay, let's go. Like, I have no concerns about this. So you um, argued with them. But to me, combative means you are yeah, you're resisting, resisting arrest resisting. and shoving. Right. And yeah. That's not the same thing as disputing verbally the arrest. Right. Um, so all that kind of starts coming out. And, you know, my daughter is listening to this whole thing and she witnessed it. And she looks at me and she's like, Daddy, you didn't do any of that. I was like, exactly. That, that's the point of this. So she's, she's getting to see real time how misinformation immediately started to spread about me. Um, she got to witness me stand up for my rights. And she wasn't there when I got released, but I showed up. 10 to 15 minutes later. So obviously she, she correlates that. Like I didn't go to jail. Um, so she's witnessing all this and over the, you know, that was pretty much the extent of the conversation that day. Um, the next week. So last week was just, it was nonstop. Um, you know, I, I, Monday came around and I, I tried reaching out to the city. I posted something on their Facebook page saying, hey, you know, you guys need to do something. I'm giving you until 2.30 to make this right. Um, I, I didn't issue any demands. I just said, make it right. And I got nothing back. Um, some people might construe that as a threat, but my intent was I wasn't going to hire an attorney. I wasn't going to seek any of this. If you would have just owned up to it immediately, maybe, you know, offered something, apology, something, and I got nothing. Uh, so I was like, okay. Fair enough. And I've proceeded. Um, that same day, I got a copy of the police report and it's, it's pretty disgusting. So uh, how did you get that copy? So I contacted the Brighton Police Department and I said, hey, you know, I would like to get a copy of a, an arrest report. Um, they asked for a name on it. I was like, well, there's not going to be a name on it. <laughs> I was like, it happened about 430 yesterday right. afternoon. They never, they never got your ID and you never told them your name. Okay. Right. So they were able to find it and I had to fill out a request form and I had to send in an ID, which <laughs> at this point, everybody in the city knows who I am. I mean, yeah. Council Member Watts has talked to the mayor. He's talked to everybody. So my name is out there. So I, I really don't care. I mean, it was in the moment, like I didn't have to give him an ID. I have nothing to hide. There was no warrants. I just didn't have to. And I shouldn't. Um, so I start reading through this report by all three officers and, uh, I've come to find out through contacts that there's an officer by the name of Zerate and he is still brand new. He swore in at the end of 2019, I believe in November or December. Um, and he's still going through the field training officer program. So he's got, you know, somebody that's been with the force for a while, basically right there making sure he does everything right. And uh, he puts in here, you know, that I was verbally abusing one of the other officers. Mm. Um, he, he puts in there that I told my daughter to be quiet. And I told my wife that we were not going to leave. Never did any of those. Um, he puts in there that uh, Officer Rogers stated that there was no other option due to the male being uncooperative and the male then widened his stance and flared his hands out in an aggressive manner stating, let's do this. I have a lawyer and retainer. 
I walked up to the male's right side and placed his hand on top of his head and the male pulled back. I gripped his right wrist and advised the male to keep his hand on his head. Officer Rogers took his right hand and placed handcuffs on his wrist, double locked them and walked the male to the patrol vehicle. First off, they gave me commands in which I complied with. So my hands are already on top of my head. How did they, how did he go to place my hand on top of my head? Second off, if uh, this other officer, Officer Rogers, was the one putting the cuffs on me, why was Officer Zaraid even involved? It becomes very cumbersome. It's, it's a safety issue for the officers. Like, it should have just been one officer. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, he puts in here again, I was verbally abusing officers, um, all kinds of stuff. The other officers, they, they were pretty accurate in the report. Um, and kind of one of the questions everybody wants to know, and you've asked a couple times, is what was the phone call and to who? Um, so this report is by Officer Hughes, and he puts in here, um, I contacted Sergeant Strzok to review what the correct charges would be if the male we contacted early does not want to leave. Sergeant Strzok advised the proper municipal charge would be 9-8-90 paragraph 3, Parks and Park Facilities Rules and Regulations. After reviewing the statute with Sergeant Strzok, it was determined this would be the most appropriate charge. They didn't even know what they were going to charge me with. Yeah, that's, that was the thing that, st that stood out was they wanted to charge you with something, but they didn't know what they could possibly charge you with, so they had to check in. As yeah, opposed to, to, this man's obviously violating this statute. We've got to pick him up. No, we're going to take this guy in because... Um, we think the parks are closed and he's giving us mouth. He's giving us lip right now. So exactly. we'll, we'll arrest him and figure out the charges later. That's kind of what it seemed like. And as a state trooper, if I didn't know what a law was, I didn't enforce it. I went and I educated myself first. I looked up the statute. I read it. I, asked, I would ask another officer, my supervisor, hey, am I on the right track with this? I would make sure I knew darn well what I was getting into before I pushed that on anybody else. Yeah. Okay, no wait, when did you, did, did you ever say, look at the sign? Like, was there ever a time when you said, look at the sign and they looked at the sign? Cause I, <laughs> so when that like pissing match kind of started, I, I told them, I was like, do you even know what the sign says? And all they could tell me was it says the park is closed. I, I left it at that because they weren't even trying to hear anything. They, they were already set in their head that this is what's going to happen. We don't care what the sign says. Obviously, they didn't know what it said. Yeah. So they, I just they didn't go. look. The fact that they didn't look is kind of <laughs> a glaring omission. I just know myself personally. I would not have been able to resist going over to the sign and pointing at the bottom and saying, four or fewer people. One, two, three. There are three of us here, and we are all related, and we all live together. We are we are in compliance with social distance rules. And we're in compliance with the sign at the park. What are you arresting me for? Like that's, exactly. well, you know, that's 2020 hindsight too. So. It is. And, you know, originally I wasn't trying to offer these officers any kind of issues. You know, I told them, write me a ticket. I'm not trying to argue. Like I wasn't trying to be that person. I didn't go to the park looking for this. I wasn't asking for attention. Right. It, it just found me that day. And uh, yeah. So why <laughs> did they, um, then they, they found out the statute that they thought they were going to cite you for violating, and then they didn't. Was that because they got pressure from someone as a result of the city councilman? Right. So when I when I fit or when I refused to provide my identification, um, obviously they can't write me a ticket. Which that ticket is actually a five hundred dollar fine and a misdemeanor charge. Um, which is. It's not even, I didn't break that violation. I didn't break that municipal code. Mm -hmm. So even if they would have wrote me that ticket, like it's unconstitutional. Yeah. Um, lost my train of thought there, you know, so. so why, why did they then release you? Um, so I'm assuming, and I can't find it in the report right off the top of my head, but uh, I'm assuming they talked to their sergeant, Sergeant Strzok again and I don't know who all got involved. It's not in the police report. Go figure. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure they were probably told to let me go. They right. didn't so probably me. one of the city councilmen or someone else put the pressure on the city manager who said, this is not worth <laughs> the publicity or the time or the pain. And so then he said, let him go. So it wasn't, oh, he obviously wasn't violating anything. It was 
this is not, this doesn't look good for us. And this is a, this is a, an infraction at best. And so, and we don't want the pressure, the political pressure being brought to bear. Yeah. Well, guess what? They're getting it now. <laughs> <laughs> right. I found out that my story actually played in the UK and I'm just like, wow. I, well, it's a crazy <laughs> story. That's why I, you know, when I saw it, I was so outraged. And all of us parents that have kids that we would normally just send down to the park and we can't do that. And so we take them and we walk around the park, you know, like I could see this happening with my girls. The fact that all of us could relate to this and we all feel like we're like one stupid um, not even mistake, just one stupid action away from being in your shoes. And, that, and, and it's so outrageous that this could happen to us, to any of us, a parent playing t-ball or catch or walking or whatever in a park with our kid and our spouse or with me. It could have been me and my three girls, because I'm not married, but that that could happen to me, that's completely outrageous. And so that's why this story uh, is, is playing the way it is. And that's why I wanted to have you on because this is not the kind of thing that's supposed to be happening in this country, pandemic or no pandemic. The constitution does not go away when there's a pandemic. There is no clause in the constitution that says this shall not apply in the case of uh, a pandemic. Uh, this this uh, shall be suspended when there is a pandemic. It's not there. Right. They didn't put it in there for a reason. Yeah, exactly. And we look and around too, and we do not see this thing being as deadly as a lot of people think it is. And so we're saying, why, why are we all sitting at home in fear and masking and gloving ourselves at the store and losing our businesses and all this for something that really, frankly, does not look all that difficult. I mean, I'm not on the front lines. I don't, you know, I'm not working in hospitals or whatever. I know this is real. I've had people say, you just think it's bunk. No, I know it's real. I know people are getting sick. I know the people are dying. I've heard 136,000 in this country have died so far. That's a big number. But we have 330, what, 333 million people in this country. So yeah. um, we don't shut down a country and start arresting people in the park for that small of a number. Compare that to heart attacks, car accidents, you know, <laughs> sorry, it's just, it's completely overbroad, overreach, and ridiculous. It is. I think the, the numbers, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the total number of cases versus the population is still less than 1%. Yeah, it's, it's very tiny. And, so, you know, so we're you doing all there, look at numbers, and, and like I said, there's, you know, they're all over the place, and, and they're calling things that aren't COVID deaths, COVID deaths, because um, you know, this person had a, a weak heart, but they also had COVID-19. So they died of a heart attack, but they also had COVID-19, so it's a COVID-19 death. So I don't even trust the statistic, the statistics. But anyway, so the other, some of the questions that some of the um, people on Facebook wanted me to ask you, well, first of all, like, has this changed the way you guys um, act when you go out in public? Are, are you still going to the park at all? Or are you done with that? Or what? Um, so actually, I went to the park the next day. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, it hasn't really changed the way we're doing things or the way I act or... Does it make anything. you a little more anxious or, you know, uh, like aware of the fact that this could happen again? Or? It does, um, I guess, in that aspect, but I think I'm just getting more and more fed up with it. Um, you know, you, you see so many different, cons different stories, so much different BS that's coming out of various politicians' mouths and these doctors and nobody is on the same page and the yeah. numbers just don't add up. And I, I'm yeah. just, I'm so irritated and frustrated by it and people are just allowing it to happen. And the, the attack I have taken on social media from all these people that are, well, you know, you could have just avoided this. You could have just complied. You could have just given them your ID. You could have just uh, become a sheeple and just gone along with it. What's wrong with you? Right. I've even had people threaten to call Child Protective Services on me. Oh, my gosh. Because I, I subjected my daughter to this. And I'm just like, you got to be kidding me. That the, the smear campaign that has launched against me is just ridiculous. Those are the people I talked about earlier in the second group. <laughs> that wants to, they want to be, they want the government to control everyone. They think that the government is our, our nanny. <laughs> that, that makes me furious. 
All right, so another question was, um, so how are your daughter and wife doing, and in particular your daughter? Do you guys talk about this now? Yeah, so my, my wife is good. She's, she's trying to stay out of it, because if she starts reading all the comments on social media, she's, she's going to get upset and frustrated. And so she's, she's trying to stay out of it. She didn't even want to be out there when they came to apologize. Um, my daughter, on the other hand, she's, she's just kind of whatever. Um, you know, it has affected her. I won't deny that. But I've also taken it as kind of a, a learning point for us. So, um, you know, she got to witness everything that happened. She got to see me release. She got to be witness to some of the conversations that were happening with city council members. Um, she's got to be on the news. And I think the most important thing is, you know, we, like I said, we went to the park the next day. And the only reason we went to the park was I wanted, to, I wanted her to read the signs. So, you know, she's, she's still working on readings. So we read the signs together. Um, we read the public order together. And uh, I gave her some definitions, you know, what is an open space? What is a park? You know, just breaking it down to the six-year-old. And I let her kind of formulate her own thoughts. You know, do you think this was an okay place for us to play? You know, did we do the right thing or were we wrong? And she kind of came up to the conclusion that it's okay to play there. You know, the parks aren't closed um, to groups of four or less. She, she knows that. And then I posed the question to her, do you think daddy's a bad guy for standing up to the cops? Or, you know, was I doing the right thing? And she agrees, you know, daddy did the right thing. Daddy isn't a bad guy. Um, and she's, she's learning that, you know, sometimes our rights are, they're human rights. They're, they're guaranteed to us by the constitution of the United States. And we've had that discussion and she, She's learning a little bit about the Constitution and civics. And um, so she understands their rights and they can't be taken away so easily. And she got to witness me stand up to them. She's realizing that sometimes it requires a sacrifice. You know, I was willing to sacrifice going to jail and whatever that may have been to stand up for that. So she's, she's a smart little girl and she's, she's catching on. And I think it'll be a good learning experience, not something she would ever get in school. And because of the traumatic incident of it, it'll stick with her for the rest of her life. Um, but, you know, we were driving around the other day and she spotted a Brighton police officer and she's like, daddy, there's cops. And I'm like, okay. Like, I'm not worried about it, but she's kind of associating cops with, you know, trampling on our rights and not doing the right thing now. Yeah. Well, I, kudos to you for taking her over there and showing her the sign and walking her through it and showing her and, and discussing um, how you handled it. That's great. And I'm, and I'm really glad that you're teaching her the Constitution. I don't think uh, most Americans or a lot of Americans seem to be forgetting right now that these rights are God-given rights and that we, through the Constitution, are allowing the government to protect those rights for us. Those <laughs> rights are not given to us by the government. And so they cannot be taken away from us by the government. And so what you did was important, in, and especially in educating her afterwards and in coming out and speaking about it now as well. So you brought up the apology. Now, I know they didn't apologize by 2.30. What was it the next day? So eventually right. they did apologize. When did that happen and what did that look like? Um, yeah, so I will kind of read and give you some timestamps of how this played out. So I, I issued that kind of, whether you want to call it a demand to the city or not, um, saying, hey, let's make this right by 2.30 today. And they, they failed to do that. And I had been in constant contact with my neighbor, Council Member Watts, and he is fed up with this. He's like, are you kidding me? He's like, they haven't done anything yet. He's like, they should have been on this same day. Um, he is very much, you know, this should never have happened. He even told me that the, the Wednesday prior to this incident, they had a special city council meeting where they discussed how they were going to handle some of these public health orders. And they, they weren't really to the point where they wanted to start enforcing it because it, it is so vague and it's constantly changing. And they were afraid something like this would happen. So they, their instructions were, let's not enforce it just yet. You know, maybe education, but th there's to be no arrest, no tickets, no citations, subpoenas, whatever. Um, that obviously didn't get conveyed to the police chief. Um, so anyways, fast forwarding on April 7th. So this happened on the 5th. Two days later, um, they put out a, 
a press release stating, today, Acting City Manager Mark Falkenberg reached out to Brighton resident Matt Mooney by telephone in an effort to arrange a meeting in person with Falkenberg and the Brighton Police Commander Frank Acosta to an offer an apology to Brighton Police, or offer an apology by Brighton Police Department in person. Falkenberg conve conveyed an apology. However, Mr. Mooney has declined the offer for an in-person meeting. On Sunday, about 4.30 p.m., officers were dispatched to respond to a complaint, blah, 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 12 to 15 people. So th they put this out stating, I declined a meeting, and that's not what happened. Um, so Tuesday morning, um, they reached out, or I'm sorry, it was Wednesday morning, I believe. They, Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever day it was. They reached out, and uh, they're like, hey, we want to come out. We want to offer you an apology in person. It'll be the acting city manager, the acting police chief, and we would like to have Council Member Watts there to video it. So they called and, you, or they emailed you, or how'd they reach out? Uh, so they called me. Okay. Um, and so Council Member Watts asked if it was okay if he gave them my phone number. I said, absolutely. You know, I'm not trying to make it difficult for him. Give him my info. Um, so they called me and they offered this and I told them, I was like, look, I have a lawyer at this point. I want to make sure that I'm protecting myself. So as of right now, I don't think that's a good idea. I was like, let me talk to my lawyer maybe in the next day or two. I didn't say no. I just said maybe in the next day or two. So they put out this press release and put that spin on it that I declined mm -hmm. an apology. Right. So then the next day after this, um, all right, let me back up. So that night they did the city council meeting and I listened to it on zoom and they did get on there and apologize, but every apology that they put out from the acting city manager, the acting police chief, some of these other council members was an apology with a, we're sorry, but on the end of it. And I'm just like, that's not an apology. Well, you know where that comes from, right? That's their lawyer. That's the lawyer. That's the city lawyer. <laughs> we're, if we admit guilt, then, you know, he can sue us. And so that's why they do that. Yeah. But to me, that's not an apology. And I wasn't very happy with that. I mean, Council Member Watts, he got on there and he offered an honest apology. Um, Council Member Johnson, he, he did attach a small butt to it, but it was kind of a, you know, we have a plush, excuse me, a professional police force. Um, you know, we have all these entities in place for internal affairs and this and that. And it wasn't a very big butt, but he still had one attached. And, you know, I know Matt Johnson personally, and you know, I don't have an issue with him, but it was still, I was frustrated. Mm -hmm. um, so then we fast forward to the next day. I tried reaching out to the acting city manager. I tried reaching out to the mayor. I tried reaching out to the acting police chief. Couldn't get a hold of anybody. Nobody would return my calls. They, they got, I feel like they were trying to do the public apology before the city council meeting to save their face. And then when they didn't get that, they kind of took a back seat. So why were you reaching out to them at this point? Um, I told them I'd contact them. I was like, you know, maybe in the next day or two. So I was reaching back out to them saying, hey, you know, if you want to do that, I'm open to it. So you had already talked to your attorney at this point? Yep. I already talked to my attorney and uh, he's like, you know, absolutely. Let them come out. He's like, don't say much. Just let them say what they're going to say. And uh, he, was on, he was on the phone, on speakerphone. He got to hear it. Um, there is a recording of it. Obviously, they didn't put it out there. Um, <laughs> and it's funny because when they did show up, it was the acting city manager, the acting police chief, council member Watts, and some sergeant from BPT um, who recorded it. And they're like, you know, we just want to reiterate what we said on the city council meeting. And basically, the, the whole thing like, took place in about two minutes. They're like, we're sorry. Do you have any questions? <laughs> so what, they videotaped themselves apologizing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then they like sent it to you? They didn't send it to me. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, was, on, was it on the website? You haven't seen it yet? No, it, it hasn't been published anywhere. Oh. Um, I, I think they were trying to potentially use it as a uh, good faith on their part. You know, they could publish it, but I think after reviewing it, they're probably like, well, that was a really weak apology. <laughs> we don't so they've know. never come over and done this in person with you. They, they did. Um, oh, right. th and that's what I'm referring to. Like, they came over. It was about two minutes long. They're like, oh, we're sorry. Okay. Do you have any questions? And so that was the filmed, end of it. And they were filming it. They were filming it. And it was a two minute, we're sorry. Do you have any questions? <laughs> yeah. Not an apology still. Yeah. Um, 
So then on the 15th, so this past week, they put out another press release saying, Brighton Police Department has conducted an investigation in the situation that occurred on Donaldson Park on Sunday, April 5th. The department has taken necessary corrective actions regarding the officers involved in the incident. In addition to the corrective actions, the department identified training needs uh, during regular patrol briefs, reviewed public health orders and city closures, and emphasized the importance of all officers wearing proper personal protective equipment when in public. Acting City Manager Mark Falkenberg and Brighton Police Commander Frank Acosta have since met in person with Matt Mooney, the person involved in the incident, and offered, uh, offered their deepest apologies to Mr. Mooney, his wife and daughter. So were yeah. your wife and daughter out there listening to the apology as well then? They were. Okay. All right. And so you've re received this little apology and you've consulted an attorney. Um, so are you planning on moving forward with some kind of legal action against the city? Absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, at, at first I kind of took the stand. Well, if they just come out and, you know, apologize and just make it right, you know, th there would be no need to go to this level. The fact it took them two days to do it, you know, was kind of unacceptable for me. And then there's so much more that goes into it. So immediately after the original video was posted on a uh, Facebook page called Eyes on Brighton, one of the city council members, uh, city councilwoman Pollock, got, went on and posted a comment defending the actions of the police officers without knowing any facts. Mm. And when people started commenting, it didn't go the way she wanted, she deleted the comment. <laughs> yeah, so. This is why people that are in office like that or connected should just keep their mouths shut. Especially if they, know that there's gonna have there's going to be pending legal action i mean it's just and it doesn't make her look good <laughs> no not at all i mean the fact that she censored people because it didn't go down her train of thought is it's ridiculous um so then we fast forward a day or two and i start seeing facebook posts pop up and uh one of them is from a lauren struck so struck should sound familiar that was the sergeant that was on the phone so this guy's wife starts taking to social media and she posts something to the effect of they were called responding to a call of 16 people in the park not social distancing they are required to respond to calls it is it is not like they were driving around and looking for people disobeying the orders they were absolutely not complying with social distancing guidelines the other dozen people in the park had no problem dispersing but of course the video doesn't show that. This guy is a former city council person, I'm not, um, and state trooper who lost his job for sexual harassment. No, not the case. Um, and has no job and wants a payday from the city. Oh, that's defamation right there. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I'm sure you're going to be discussing that with your attorney if you haven't already. Boy, oh, that, I have. His, her husband should have been like, honey, uh-uh, we don't do that. We do. Boy, there's so many problems with that. And it's important to note that in, in the process of all this, I met with the, uh, a commander from Bright PD who is doing the internal affairs investigation. And I raised the question of, you know, what if I start receiving retaliation from these officers? And he made it very clear that his orders to these officers were going to be, they will have no contact. They will not discuss this. They will not have any involvement in this. Um, he's like, if they do, it's an immediate fireable offense. So I have the wife of the sergeant involved posting this. And then I find out um, that there is a, a lady on one of the next door apps that is bashing me. Um, let's see, where did I put Yeah, when we mentioned next door earlier, it seems to bring out the worst in people. <laughs> it, it does. And so she is, she is defending, after the city of Brighton came out and apologized, She's defending the actions of these officers. She's saying, I have no idea what I'm talking about. I don't know the difference between arrest and detained. Um, I should have just complied, blah, blah, blah. Come to find out she is a Brighton police officer. Oh. And, and to add more insult, she, um, she was only sworn in in November, December, the same time as Officer Zarate, who was involved in this. So I hope you have screen grabs of these things. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, because, so shouldn't she be getting fired over this since supposedly she, they're not supposed to? You would think the sergeant would be immediately fired and this officer would be immediately fired. But um, 
I actually had somebody reach out and he sent me all this. Um, I saw it, but I didn't know who she was at, at the time. And he's the one that informed me. She's doing and it on next door. Yeah. And then there was also another guy posting very similar stuff to her uh, by the name of Nick Inman and come to find out that's her husband. So they're <laughs> both taking to social media, bashing me. Um, so and, this guy and that opens the police. Uh, that opens the police department for further action. Don't they realize how stupid that is? I mean, yeah, her lawyer can argue that she's doing this on her own, but why <laughs> not fired them for doing this or, uh, you know, some way disciplined or something. But you know. I, I am dumbfounded. There should be no public but, comment by police officers about cases. That's what they have public affairs officers for. Wow. Yeah. It, it just keeps getting so, more and more stupid. So the guy that sent me this, and I won't name him, but uh, he has 140 screenshots of these conversations. And he, I gave him the email address of the Internal Affairs Investigation Commander, um, who he sent them to. And the response back from both Commander Al Sharon and the city manager, because he sent it to them as well, um, was that, so Al Sharon, who's in charge of the Internal Affairs Investigation, responds back. He's like, I received your emails last night. The person, the personnel allegedly involved in this matter are not under my command. I have forwarded your emails to Commander Frank Acosta, Acting Chief of Police, and Commander Matt Domenico, Patrol Commander. Thanks. Um, so then from Mark Falkenberg, um, the Acting City Manager, um, basically he writes back, sir, thank you for your follow-up because nobody came out and said anything. There's been no Corresponds on this. He's like, these emails were all forwarded, all forwarded to acting chief of police department on April 14th when I first received them from the council member. Corrective action and discipline has been, has taken place immediately. Um, I haven't heard anything as far as these actions yet. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happened, but I doubt they were fired. All right. So he, that's obviously going to be part of the lawsuit. Um, or maybe there might be separate lawsuits, but um, you're going forward with something. Yes. Your attorney can tell you what's the best action. And if for some reason you um, part ways with that attorney, I can guarantee you I can name at least a few people who'd be willing to take up the, the cause. So um, I'm, I'm glad that you are working on that and, and getting some justice. <laughs> um, just, you know, let's wrap this up. A few, just the last few questions. Um, if they had like, and honestly here, if they had come out and given you a heartfelt apology that you really felt like they were sorry that they had done this and that um, they, I mean, they really felt bad about it, would you still have pursued this? Actually? Probably not to this extent. I mean, well, the, only thing I like originally, the only thing I originally wanted was the apology mm -hmm. and I wanted these officers to have proper education. Yeah. That, that was my big thing in the beginning of this, was educate your officers. Well, and that's going to happen, I guarantee that, one, <laughs> one way or another. However, obviously, they need to be, there needs to be some education on what you don't say on social media as a wife of the commander and as a police officer and police officer's husband. But you would think that would be common sense, but um, yeah, that's got to be addressed. And then, um, just trying to see if there are any other questions. I... Um, I think we've covered everything that my um, Facebook friends wanted me to ask you. Um, any closing thoughts on what this has uh, meant to you? And I mean, ha how have you handled it? Has it been difficult for you? Has it been like a loss of sleep kind of thing? Or It has. Um, you know, it's, I never went to the park looking for this. I'm not this kind of person. Um, you know, I'm very much an introvert type, maybe an introvert, extrovert, but I don't go seeking attention like this. And boy, have I gotten a lot of attention. Yes, you have. <laughs> um, you know, my emails have blown up. My social media accounts have blown up. Phone. Okay, mostly, if you had to do percentages between uh, supportive and attacking, what, what percentage of the, those communications have been supportive? You know... I guess just to give a rough number, probably 50, 50. Interesting. Um, anybody that's personally reached out through like direct message or email or phone has been very supportive. Um, 
all the negative stuff has just been comments on posts. Yeah, and, that's the cowardly way to do it. Yeah, keyboard but, warriors. Yeah. Yes, I've seen, uh, a friend and I discussed this recently about how people will say so many things on, on social media that they would never say in person. And that should be, that should be the rule of thumb. If you wouldn't say it to the person, to their face, you shouldn't be saying it to them on social media. Unfortunately, it does happen. Well, I wish you the best of luck. Um, keep in touch with me. Uh, let me know, you know, what happens going forward with the, the lawsuit or if there are any other repercussions or anything else happens. Um, and then, you know, if you're willing, I'll have you come back on and, and update us. Absolutely. Yeah. I will keep you informed and uh, I'm, I'm sure something's going to come out of this. Time will tell. Yeah. And, uh, we and, can... and hopefully, if nothing else, this gives people the uh, courage to stand up themselves and not just go along blindly with these ridiculous um, orders. And um, I think you handled it. I think you handled it well. I don't know any of us that would not have been at least somewhat um, disputing the arrest. <laughs> it's not the same as combat. So um, I'm with you on this. Keep me posted. Um, I'm going to post this on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, I will um, tag you in it so you can find it right away. And um, like, I'm not going to take anything out of it. It's, it's this uh, totally unedited um, podcast. So thank Sounds you so great. much for um, meeting me with, with me today. And I hope you feel like you got out what you wanted to get out there. Yes, definitely. We, we definitely had a good conversation about it. And thank you for having me on. And, uh, you know, maybe a part two coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. You're welcome. Sure. All right. Thank you for listening to Annette on Life, Liberty, and Happiness. Again, you can find this on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, AnnetteTalks.com, YouTube, all the usual places. Um, feel free to comment. Uh, if it's obnoxious or rude, I'll take it down. <laughs> But um, feel free to weigh in on what you think about this, what you think about how Matt handled it, what you think about these stay-at-home orders, police actions, anything else. Um, you can do that on YouTube or on Facebook, Annette Talks, or Facebook, my personal account, which is Annette Mashler Bybee, or on AnnetteTalks.com. Thank you for listening.